Speaker? Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're privileged to have Dr. Angela Zombeck speaking to us. She's an associate professor and graduate, student, graduate school coordinator for the Department of History at University of North Carolina at Wilmington. Additionally, she is the managing editor interpreting the Civil War text and context with the Kent State University Press. Dr. Zombeck has written numerous articles and books and is currently working on a new one titled Stronghold of the Union, Key West Under Martial Law. We'll look forward to a talk on that in the future. Thank you. Please let's welcome Dr. Zombeck. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. And it may or may not be a coincidence that I decided to write a book on Key West after a book on prisons. I don't know. Change of scenery, right? Okay. Just waiting for the slide to come up. Perfect. Okay. So this first talk um, that I'm giving tonight is based off of my first book project. And what I'd like to start with is just to think about the Civil War era and the federal government itself. And when you think about the Civil War and you think about Civil War prisons, the first thing that comes to mind is the magnitude of the POW crisis. And the next question, I think, is why wasn't there a system for this? And I think that's kind of a peculiar question to ask in many ways, because the federal government in the 19th century was nowhere near what it is today. So when, <laughs> and, you know, we go several directions with that, right? But, but for the purpose of administration, I think we assume that the federal government is going to have a way to deal with things. Like, that's in place. And when the Civil War broke out, really nothing was in place. This book project looked at the development of penitentiaries as kind of the basis for military prisons. And that's really the thing that I'm going to be talking about tonight, is how that system of penitentiary development really informed how Union and Confederate officials dealt with the crisis of imprisonment. The federal government had virtually no experience with prisons prior to the Civil War. There was one federal penitentiary. It was in Washington, D.C. There were approximately 17 federal laws. That's it. And they applied to the District of Columbia, the Western Territories, the coastal fortifications. So we can look to the previous wars as a model. But as far as what actually went on in the prisons, how Union and Confederate officials ran them, and really how prisoners thought about themselves, despite the fact that they were POWs, which are, of course, not considered criminals, especially according to the laws of war, we really get a lot by looking at how the penitentiary system development developed. Next slide, please. So first, I do want to start off with some numbers, because, like I said, that's one of the first things that comes to people's mind. The total number of POWs taken during the Civil War was 674,000. That amounts to about 16% of total enlistments. So in the United States history, that's more than any other war before or since. And when we're talking about prisoners of war, if you look at the uh, Lieber Code that was authored in 1863, and I'll get to that a little bit later on, but that definition is broad. So the first thing that you really think about is, of course, the soldiers on the battlefield. But that's not technically the entire definition of who a POW was. These could include civilians, too. We have some relatively good records on the soldiers that were incarcerated. The record is less clear when it comes to civilians who were captured. So both north and south, the estimate after four years of war given the suspension of habeas corpus, 
is about 13,535. When we look at the individual prison camps, they could really be anything. So they were 150 different compounds that held prisoners of war. Those could be commandeered buildings, including factories. Those could be hastily erected stockades. They could be training grounds that then got transformed. They could be, and they were, actual existing penitentiaries and jails themselves. By the time the Civil War ended, over 56,000 prisoners of war died in confinement. So you see the numbers that I have up there on the screen in Confederate prisons. So that means those are Union POWs, 30,218. That amounts to a little over 15% of those who are incarcerated. In United States prisons, so these are then Confederate POWs, the death total was 25,796, which is slightly over 12%. So the overall rate is about 13% of the total number of individuals who were confined. If you compare that to the battlefield, battlefield deaths are about 5% of total enlistments killed. So like I said, neither side really made preparations for a prisoner of war crisis because nobody thought that the Civil War was going to last as long as it did. But once it was clear that the war wasn't going to be over very quickly, I believe that both Union and Confederate officials looked to the antebellum period and what was going on in state penitentiaries as a model. Next slide. That up there is the title of my book that came out in 2018. This is where the research for this talk is coming from. And really, the establishment of the penitentiary program, I really even can't call it a system because every state ran its own penitentiary. So they, the prisoners would stay um, in a cell. Generally, cells are about six to nine feet long, maybe three to four feet wide, maybe nine to 12 feet high. So they're intended for a single solitary individual. Like military prisons during the Civil War, however, the penitentiaries in the antebellum period got very, very crowded. But I really think that Union and Confederate officials based their assumptions about how prisoners should be operated and how inmates should be treated on what antebellum reformers designed penitentiaries to be. So some of these assumptions about incarceration were that undergirded the penitentiary system and that we can see reflected in many ways in military prisons is that sentences should be just, inmates should be well provisioned, labor, physical activity, education, and religious instruction should be apparent in the institutions and that those benefit inmates. And finally, that physical punishment should be tempered. So these assumptions carry over into the war and they influenced how military prison officials dealt with the crisis of imprisonment and really how POWs themselves thought about themselves as captives. Next slide. So a few of the institutions, like I said, there were 150 compounds that held prisoners during the Civil War, so I can't possibly talk about them all. So what I'm looking at is a few case studies. The first case study is Virginia. The Virginia Penitentiary was constructed in 1796. It opened in 1800. It had 168 sleeping cells, so that represented its intended capacity, and it exceeded that, as most other penitentiaries did. Also in Richmond, the military prison and we'll be talking about is Castle Thunder. And one of the parallels is immediately apparent when we look at Castle Thunder, because when it was established, Commandant George Alexander dubbed it one of the only penitentiaries that the Confederacy had. So the types of prisoners that were held in Castle Thunder were Confederate deserters, federal POWs, 
political prisoners, including black men, black and white females, all together, but separated among the different factories that were commandeered to make Castle Thunder. Its intended capacity was 1,400. The highest that got was over 3,000. Next slide, please. Next is the state of Georgia. The Georgia Penitentiary was proposed in 1803. It opened in 1817, and it was very small. It had 23 cells and four solitary cells for refractory inmates. On the other side, during the war, we can look at the notorious prison camp of Andersonville. It initially started out as 16 acres. It was later expanded to 26. The capacity was intended to be from 10 to 12,000. Maximum peak prison population was 32,899. So I just gave you the dimensions of the penitentiary cells. If you were to break it down and kind of look throughout the stockade, the POWs that were there had about that much space, but probably less. Next slide. When we come to Washington, D.C., I mentioned this is the only federal penitentiary that exists prior to the Civil War. It was eventually closed during the war in 1862 because Abraham Lincoln needed it to manufacture war supplies, and that was something that did go on in penitentiaries. But it opened in 1831. Its capacity was 214. And it only held federal prisoners. And that's significant because, again, as I mentioned, the federal government wasn't that big. There weren't too many federal laws. Federal offenders in other areas were held in state penitentiaries as per federal law. So you could have that mix in there. Next slide. The military prison in Washington that we're looking at is Old Capitol Prison. If you're familiar with Washington, D.C., where Old Capitol Prison was is where the Supreme Court sits now. So in its first iteration, its um, original capacity was 500. And then later on, there was a series of row houses behind the original structure that got commandeered, and the capacity increased to 1,500. It held political prisoners, Confederate POWs, suspected spies, and Union deserters. So that intended capacity of 1,500 after the expansion was maxed out. The maximum number of prisons that were held at the old capital was 2,673. Next slide. Moving north to my home territory, Ohio. The Ohio Penitentiary first opened in 1815. It became too crowded by 1831, and so here we see one of kind of the trendsetters that we'll see during the Civil War where prison officials decided capacity's too much, we must expand. So the Ohio Penitentiary was expanded to 700. Throughout the 1850s, it held over 1,000 prisoners. So if you can imagine those cell dimensions that are supposed to be for one individual, they could hold upwards of three or four men in those tiny cells. Um, two military prisons to look at in Ohio. One is Camp Chase, which held mostly political prisoners and POWs. Um, after Commissary General of Prisoners William Hoffman took over, he decided that he wanted to move the officers out of Camp Chase, and so he selected a little island that's near Sandusky called Johnson's Island, a very pleasant place to be, let's say in February. It's right in Lake Erie. So the two um, prisoners, the two prison camps, that is, Camp Chase was 160 acres, capacity 3,500 to 4,000, maximum population 9,423. But it still had, as many other military prisons did, those strong solitary cells for inmates who were refractory. So it's kind of replicating that idea from the penitentiaries. Um, Johnson's Island was a 300-acre island. Its capacity was 1,000. The most it held was 3,256 throughout 12 buildings. And then there was also a camp hospital. Next slide. <clears throat> and the final case study is North Carolina. North Carolina was actually one of three states, the other two being South Carolina and Florida, that didn't have a penitentiary before the Civil War. 
I guess there's a reflection of the Civil War in the opening of the North Carolina Penitentiary in 1870 because it wasn't quite finished yet and it started receiving convicts when it was just a stockade. But at Salisbury, the first prisoners arrived there in December 1861. They're mostly military convicts. There's Union and Confederate deserters. There's hostages, political prisoners, Unionists, federal POWs, and later in the war, Confederate draft dodgers. So that kind of gives you just there kind of a broader idea of the people who would have been incarcerated um, during the Civil War. Salisbury was an old cotton factory, and um, that building was a four-story brick building, which was approximately 120 by 45 feet, and then it had an outer um, palisade with logs jammed into the ground to expand the prison's capacity. Its max capacity was 2,000. The highest the population got at Salisbury was 10,321. And like Castle Thunder, it was dubbed another penitentiary of the Confederacy. Next slide. So that brings us to the question of what types of ideologies, what types of thoughts really guided how imprisonment should operate? And there we can look to the antebellum period. And we have an organization here, the Boston Prison Discipline Society, and also an individual, Francis Lieber, who was later tapped by Abraham Lincoln to publish the Lieber Code, or General Orders Number 100, in 1863. <clears throat> so first, if we look at the Boston Prison Discipline Society, one of the things that we learned from their reports is that institutions of confinement were analyzed in the same breath throughout the entire 19th century. So the Boston Prison Discipline Society published its first report in 1826. It included its findings on prisons in Europe, findings on insane asylums, reports on local and county jails, reports on houses of refuge for juvenile delinquents, and the 23rd annual report in 1848, which is of course a year of a lot of unrest in Europe, actually included a report on military imprisonment in Great Britain. The Boston Prison Discipline Society was really emphatic about how inmates should be treated. And remember, these are convicts. So if we take these ideologies and we apply them to citizen soldiers during the Civil War who are men absent the conflict that would have not had anything to do with imprisonment, nor would they have anything to do with war, you can imagine how much more concern people had during wartime. So what the Boston Prison Discipline Society really emphasized was that in prisons, as they're run, there should be particular regards to security, inspection, ventilation, light, cleanliness, instruction, meaning religious instruction and education, because the idea was there should be this program of reform that once convicts got out, they are productive members of society. And the last concern was sickness. When reformers looked at prison registers and they commented on the death rates, they lost their minds, really, when 2% of a prison population would have died. And I just kind of gave you the stats as far as what the deaths were during the Civil War. So again, you can see that the, the concern would be magnified, really, during the Civil War. The other regulations that came out in the antebellum period were classification of inmates. So military prison officials tried to do some of that as far as POWs, civilians, what have you. There's particular attention to inmates' clothing, their diet, their employment, and the government and mode of punishment in prisons, with a special emphasis on religious instruction. So these kind of ideas actually get reflected by Francis Lieber. Lieber himself experienced imprisonment. He was a political prison, prisoner held by the Prussian authorities in the early 1820s for his alleged role in a plot between the German and French secret societies to overthrow their respective governments. So when he came over to the United States, I really believe that that experience of imprisonment influenced how he thought about incarceration. And he articulated his ideas in the antebellum period in two pretty significant publications. One was his popular essay on penal law, published in 1838, and the second 
was his letter to Governor Noble of South Carolina, published in 1839. So in those writings, and then we can see this reflected later in the Lieber Code in 1863, Lieber emphasized certainty of punishment, not severity, and also emphasized that punishment should be humane. So when General Orders Number 100 was published in 1863, it echoed a lot of these concerns that the Boston Prison Discipline Society had raised and that Lieber himself had written about during the antebellum period. So in General Orders 100, Lieber wrote that during wartime, the state will employ military law, which should be strictly guided by the principles of justice, honor, and humanity. Those are Lieber's words. So those ideas kind of harken back to the antebellum principle that punishment should be slow, certain, and humane. The other things that were emphasized in the Libra Code that deal with POWs is that POWs are subject to imprisonment as necessary for safety, and that the mode of treating captives may be varied according to the demands of safety. So if you look at the laws of war there, and these eventually become the basis for the Geneva Conventions, there's, a lot, there's quite a lot of wiggle room, right, as far as giving administrators and guards kind of leeway to treat inmates as they need to be treated. The other thing that Lieber emphasized in General Orders Number 100 that's directly taken from the antebellum period is that the POWs may be required to work for the benefit of their captor's government. The idea behind that, that Lieber believed in and that people before the Civil War believed in, was that responsible, law-abiding citizens should not be financially responsible for the upkeep of the institutions themselves or the prisoners. So if you look back through reports of the penitentiaries, like one from 1836 from the Ohio Penitentiary, the directors, as they're getting the penitentiary functional and in, in inviting prison labor in to that institution, are eagerly anticipating the day when, their words, the virtuous portion of our community will cease to be taxed for the support and punishment of the criminal. A similar sentiment was raised in, the, in Virginia in 1824, and those directors of the Virginia Penitentiary contended that society must be entitled to remuneration from convict labor since prisoners broke the law. Now, if we fast forward to the Civil War, we hear these same ideas coming from the pens of military prison officials. So in July 1863, the Provost Marshal of Richmond, Major Isaac Carrington, urged Captain W.S. Winder, who was Commandant of Castle Thunder, to employ Castle Thunder's prisoners who were serving long sentences to, quote, materially lessen the expense of their keeping. Later that same year, Carrington contended that federal deserters, most of whom were foreigners and common laborers, should work. And so Confederate authorities put them to work building fortifications and performing manual labor for the Confederate Army. If we jump into North Carolina and Salisbury in 1864, Assistant Adjutant General Garnet Andrews evaluated the prisoners who were in Salisbury, and he concluded that there were numerous Yankee deserters and convicts who were skillful mechanics, blacksmiths, gunsmiths, carpenters, shoemakers, joiners, harness makers, and tailors. And so Andrews, looking at this lot of prisoners, said, with a good system of supply and the right tools, Salisbury Prison could be made not only self-sustaining, but of considerable value to the government. And that, honestly, was really the goal of the state penitentiaries themselves as industrial labor came inside of those walls. At Old Capitol Prison in Washington, authorities used labor on the public works to relieve overcrowding and to also lessen expenses. So in March 1863, Union General in Chief Henry Halleck noted that 100 prisoners were sentenced to hard labor on the public works and rejoice that their number is daily increasing since they, like I said, keep the cost down 
and alleviate the overcrowding that's going on in the Old Capitol Prison. At Camp Chase, in July and December of 1862, Union officials there ordered prisoners to dig vaults, to whitewash buildings, to drain standing water, to construct roads to improve the camp. And the rationale, coming from inspector, Union inspector H.M. LaZalle, was that any work that can have any benefit to the prisoners had to be done by themselves as far as it is, is practical, because Union authorities didn't want to have to contract out for that. Finally, even at Andersonville, conditions there were, I mean, they're pretty bad right off the bat. Once the prison opened in February of 1864, it starts filling very quickly. The infrastructure was lacking. And so very quickly, on March 9th, Colonel Alexander Persons, who commanded the post, there's a lot of different levels of command that we'll kind of get into here, but Persons commanded the post, Henry Wurz commanded the stockade. So this is an order coming from Persons, and he's authorizing the formation of a detail of prisoners to work on the different buildings. Again, same idea, get the work done and keep the costs down. Next slide, please. So like I said at the beginning, the federal government, the first time it really has experience dealing with a large number of prisoners is during the Civil War. And so they, they try to step in, but the problem is this, state authorities are really used to overseeing what goes on in institutions of confinement. And some of these state governors, probably the best example that I came across was this guy up here, this is David Todd. He was a governor of Ohio early in the war, and he believed himself in control, not only of the Ohio Penitentiary, but also of Camp Chase. So Todd issues orders for Camp Chase. He referred to himself in correspondence. His correspondence is a joy to read. It's very entertaining. He always signs it with governor and commander in chief, which the way the, the volunteer troops are raised, I mean, it kind of makes sense, but he still just keeps doing it. And he also appointed commandants, and it's interesting, some of the commandants that he appointed at Camp Chase, one of them being Granville Moody. Most of these guys who ran prisons, penitentiaries or military prisons, have absolutely no experience with prisons whatsoever. Well, Granville Moody does, but here's his experience. He was, for a few years, the chaplain at the Ohio Penitentiary. And so Governor Todd thinks, all right, well, this guy's, you know, he's fit, he can run, run Camp Chase. Well, Todd, believing himself in control, and federal officials are like, now wait a second, we should really be running that because it's a military prison. And so the federal government sends that inspector that I just mentioned, H.M. Lazell, out to Columbus to go to Governor Todd and tell him that we've got this. This is our purview. So Lazell shows up with his goal being to establish federal authority over Camp Chase, but in his correspondence back to Washington, he writes that he didn't deem himself at all justified in suggesting to Todd, in more than the most general terms, that Commissary, Commissary General of Prisoners William Hoffman had control of all matters concerning prisoners there. So that initial message that LaZelle came out to give Todd was weak, so Todd still believed himself in control until April of 1863 when Brigadier General John Mason was assigned. He was a commander of U.S. volunteers and a professional military man. So he finally assumes command of the prison and he clearly established federal oversight. But this problem is apparent not just in correspondence between Todd and officials in Washington, it's also very apparent to civilians in Columbus. And, and so some civilians, like there was a local pastor named N.A. Reed, he's writing into the newspapers, and he's exposing this issue of control. And so he believes, as he's writing to the newspaper, that one, rebel soldiers are criminals. He doesn't use the phrase prisoner of war, he uses criminals. And he believes that they should be treated with humanity as we treat convicts in the penitentiary. His words. But he admitted that this was a really difficult task 
because it seemed to be a mixed question as to who had authority over the prisoners in Columbus. So there were similar problems in the Confederacy. If we look at North Carolina, we can see that North Carolina, like I said, did not have a penitentiary during the antebellum period, but it is going to have Salisbury established relatively quickly. The first commandant of Salisbury was Braxton Craven, and he was appointed by the state governor, Henry Clark. So Confederate officials recognized, and prison officials recognized, that they were subordinate to the Confederate government. But Craven is sitting here with this appointment from the state governor going, who do I report to? And so he sits down shortly after assuming command in December 1861, and he writes to Secretary of War Judah Benjamin, and he asks Judah Benjamin to do two things. One, to confirm his authority over the prison, since he was appointed by the North Carolina governor and not the Confederate government. And two, he says, can you increase my rank? He had the rank of captain, and that's another huge problem in some of these camps. So Benjamin gets this letter, and he says, okay, if the governor believes that you're the best guy for the job, then you can oversee the guard. But I'm going to leave you subordinate to the Confederate quartermaster, and I'm not changing your rank. So you can see that he has very limited power then in what he can actually do to oversee the prison. One last thing, though, that Craven requested comes directly from knowledge of what went on in state penitentiaries, and that is he asked Secretary of War Judah Benjamin for a chaplain to be assigned to the prisoners at Salisbury because he believed that somebody needed to be responsible, and it should be the authorities, for their religious outlook. So this issue of control raised a whole bunch of problems, a whole bunch of confusions during the war. But we can kind of see how, with requests like a chaplain with issues of making prisoners of war work, we can see in those ways some examples of how the penitentiary program was actually influencing military prisons. We'll talk more about here on the next slide. So the penitentiary program itself actually emerged straight from military punishment. <clears throat> there were two types of penitentiary models in the antebellum period. Both were based on solitary confinement, although that, given overcrowding, never really worked. In one model, the Auburn system, Convicts would be sleeping by themselves at night and working in congregate shops during the day. In the other system, the Pennsylvania system, um, that's a system that was pioneered at Eastern State Penitentiary, which is in Philadelphia. That's an example of a cell to kind of give you an idea of what they would have looked like. That was solitary confinement around the clock, ideally one prisoner per cell. So the model that we're really focusing on here is the Auburn system, and that was developed by War of 1812 veteran Elam Linz, who formed his ideas on punishment based on his military service. So in the Auburn system of punishment, prisoners were subject to a daily routine. They rose and slept by the bell. They assembled in companies for roll call. And they marched in lockstep. You can see the example of the prisoners marching in lockstep there to work in the shop. So that's exactly what Linz envisions, really, is this army of captive workers who will live in solitary confinement by night and work together by day, manufacturing anything from shoes, nails, clothing, saddles, any of those types of items. The prisoners are all under relatively close supervision, but I think one of the things that we kind of overlook when we talk about prisons is the guards. Being a guard was relatively hard work, and it, they were really also subject to some pretty close supervision. They're working long shifts. They do rotate every now and then, but they also don't get a lot of glory. That's true during the antebellum period, but it's especially true during the Civil War, where, of course, especially when the war breaks out, young men are chomping at the bit to join the ranks to prove themselves on the battlefield. 
So some of the rules and regulations that govern the behavior of guards, for example, in Ohio, at the Ohio Penitentiary, guards were not allowed to talk with each other. They were prohibited from, here's the list, singing, whistling, immoderate laughter, boisterous conversation, and exciting discussions upon politics, religion, or any other subject which might disturb the harmony and good order of the prison. And that kind of gives us a good idea of what the prison guards and the military prisons during the Civil War were subject to, too. They're not really supposed to communicate with each other. They're not supposed to communicate with inmates because the commandants are usually afraid of prisoners and the guards forming associations that could in some way benefit the prisoners. So at Castle Thunder, guards could only approach the prisoners when they had to leave their quarters because they couldn't leave their apartments without proper guard. Think lockstep. At Andersonville, there were work details that went on either inside of the stockade or especially out. If there were guards that were supervising those work details, which there were, they had very strict orders not to talk to the prisoners on matters that were outside of business, and they also had strict orders to not let anybody, passersby, talk to the prisoners because of that relationship. Knowledge. Of course, you hear a lot about you know, the mythology of escape from Andersonville, right? They want to, the officials want to prevent that. So prison officials are responsible for meeting out punishments in military prisons that actually originate in penitentiaries and in and of themselves were informed by military discipline. Next slide. And so here some of them are. These are sketches um, from the Library of Congress. It's where the collection is held by Charles Wellington Reed. And some of the punishments that you can see, I don't know if I can get this to work, let's find out. Yes. Bucking and gagging, one. Also hanging by the thumbs. So these are interesting um, punishments to look at because they would have been coming from the prison officials. In a place like Andersonville, when a inmate did something to anger others, like for example, there was a lot of tunneling going on there, and if one of those prisoners decided to be a whistleblower, they might take it upon themselves to do something like this. You know, to, and if they didn't have a board, they probably didn't in Andersonville, but they would actually take indelible ink and like write the prisoner's crime on his head and make him march around the stockade. So we kind of see the, the development of these military punishments coming into the military prisons. So if people want to try to escape, like for example, in 1864, prisoner John King, he was held at Camp Chase. He's thinking about getting out. He wants to escape. But he knows that if he tries that and he gets caught, one, he could be shot in the act. That was authorized by the laws of war. But if he's not shot, then he could be hanged by the thumbs. He could be compelled to work at hard labor with a ball and chain attached to his ankle, as convicts in penitentiaries were. He could be bucked and gagged in solitary confinement and fed on a bread and water diet. Those are all punishments that were used frequently in penitentiaries during the antebellum period and then translated over into military prisons during the Civil War. As far as offenses go, Prisoners at all these locations that we're talking about, and even the ones we're not talking about, are misbehaving in similar ways. They're devising escape plots, they're fighting with each other, they're stealing from each other, and, and demonstrating general other acts of disobedience. And so these punishments that we just talked about were implemented. But there's also, in addition to these kind of physical punishments, there's also the ideology that prisoners should reform. And that means slightly different things in penitentiaries as compared to military prisons. But then again, there are some overlaps. So next slide. The penitentiary is supposed to expose inmates to education and religious instruction to make prisoners find their way. And also the program of work, too. Prison labor had that reformatory impact so that Prisoners could learn something while they're, where the, while they're held behind bars, and then once they're out, they could be productive members of society. So that, in addition to religious reform, is what penitentiary officials were going for. In military prisons, there is that religious reform aspect apparent. 
and that chaplains are trying to get into the prisons to reach the, the prisoners themselves. The other way that reform happened in military prisons, especially towards the end of the war, after the exchange cartel broke down in the summer of 1863, was compelling POWs to take the oath of allegiance. And actually, in many prisons, prison officials recognized that if they used chaplains to try to get prisoners of war to take the oath of allegiance, that was an effective way to do it. Because an oath really meant something in the 19th century, number one, and also the prisoner would have been taking it from a clergyman. Therefore, if they break it, not only are they breaking an oath, but they're also then thinking that they're doing something morally wrong, right? So prisoners were targets of reform, but also there are some guards that, if you can imagine, this is not an easy job, and sometimes they themselves needed to go through some reformatory exercises. Example of that is in April 1862, chaplain A.W. Mangum had to travel from Hillsborough to Salisbury to minister to the prisoners. And he writes in his diary one day that he gets at the prison at 4 o'clock in the morning and then he is forced to preach two long sermons, which is kind of a strange complaint from an ordained minister. But he almost immediately, in his writings, like you can kind of see the, the introspection going on, he almost immediately corrects himself and he says, you know, I'm, I'm quite content in laboring hard for the fulfillment of my duties because he believed that the reward in heaven awaits him. And that's kind of the message that he, of course, wants to communicate to the prisoners as well. Prisoners tried, if they didn't have access to a chaplain, they tried to take religious reform and good behavior upon themselves. But many of them admit that this is a really, really difficult thing to do, and especially in a place like Andersonville. So a prisoner there named William Peabody noted that the dire circumstances in the stockade made that prison, quote, a great place for swearing in all kinds of wickedness. <laughs> so it's interesting that he doesn't, have, he doesn't have access to a chaplain. There were actually, um, you know, some soldiers who had a religious training, and there were some Catholic priests that were allowed into Andersonville um, for a period of time. But Peabody doesn't mention them. And so he mentions that, the swearing and the wickedness, as what inspires him to change his ways. So he, like many POWs, wrote a diary. They didn't send letters oftentimes to their families because they were embarrassed that they were incarcerated because they associated that with being a criminal. That was only the, their only basis of reference, really. So he writes in his diary, he wrote it actually as if he was writing to his wife. And he promised in that diary that if he returned home, he would be a better man and would never find fault with anything again. So throughout the 19th century, prisoners, whether they're in penitentiaries or military prisons, are encouraged to keep this kind of hope, and a lot of times they're encouraged by outsiders. Next slide. This is a really interesting document that I found at the National Archives. Um, it was in the Johnson's Island file, and it's a prison guard register. And typically what these are used for are recording inmates who misbehave and exactly what they did. But I, I don't think you can see this at all. But in this bottom quarter here on this register, one of the guards wrote the Our Father. So to me, that just was an interesting document. And it's an indication that religion was so important in these institutions. It was established as such. Every state was supposed to fund a chaplain to work just about full-time in the penitentiaries. That rarely happened. But I really think that people during the Civil War knew this, and there's some examples of clergymen who take this understanding and try to get into prisons. Like at Johnson's Island in Sandusky, there was a local Catholic priest named Father Molin. He was the chaplain of the 123rd Ohio. And he recognized that there were spiritual deficiencies, his words, of Confederate POWs at that prison. And so he wrote to federal authorities, and he requested to enter Johnson's Island because he said, 
These poor misguided men would bear with resignation their well-deserved punishment if, they were on, if only they were allowed the consolation of a priest. That's what he wrote to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. So he argued, and he's, he's really kind of using the penitentiary system as the basis, that for all the provisions that federal officials made for the physical demands of POWs at Johnson's Island, they should make equal provisions for their spiritual well-being. And so eventually, U.S. authorities let him into Johnson's Island. And we see examples of religious reform. There's actually a general revival that sweeps both the Union and Confederate armies in the winter of 1863-1864. And we can also see that apparent in prisons, and especially in prisons like Johnson's Island, where there was a chaplain or a clergyman present. So in that winter, prisoner James Joyner is recalling what's going on as far as religion is concerned, and he professes that several men have converted and have joined the church. And so that conversion really persisted at Johnson's Island throughout that year. So religion and reform, those activities help prisoners withstand confinement. Some of them are flat out sick of it and they want to get out. And there are some pretty strong parallels between escapes that happen, especially those en masse, at military prisons and at um, penitentiaries. Next slide. So in June 1843, just to give you an example of um, parallel escapes, 70 convicts escaped from the Georgia Penitentiary. They agreed to a signal, they rushed the guard, and they broke open the gate. 11 of the fugitives disappeared amidst fire from the guards. One was wounded, six were recaptured. Another died from the wounds that he incurred while fighting with two black men who were trying to arrest him. So that's the Georgia case in 1843. 21 years later, if we fast forward to July 1864 at Camp Chase, those prisoners plot a stampede. It's going to be on Independence Day. What better day to escape than that? So their cue is the sanitary cart. When the sanitary cart exits the gate, they're going to rush. So once that cart got there, a gang of prisoners rushed and overpowered the guard. 30 men fled as the guards in Ohio, like those in Georgia, started firing at the fugitives. They wounded two as the others hid in the nearby woods. Finally, members of the 88th Ohio Regiment that was on guard at Camp Chase recaptured all of the runaways. Two of them withstood bullet wounds, one had his arm amputated, and the other was not seriously hurt. So there could be, the, be these mass escapes, but there could also be associations between prisoners and guards, and that's what happened at Salisbury in December of 1864. Confederacy's in dire straits by this point. They're getting pretty much anybody they could to guard the prisons. One man who they have guarding Salisbury is Lieutenant Wellborn. He's a Unionist. He defected from the rebels, and he finally got nabbed to guard Salisbury. So what Wellborn did was he helped two political prisoners, Junius Henry Brown and Albert Richardson, who were newspapermen, to escape. So Wellborn gave them tips on how to reach Union lines, and once they reached Union lines, some sympathetic blacks guided them through Tennessee, and you know a lot about that escape because these are journalists and they're going to write about it voluminously. Um, Welburn actually facilitated some other escapes, but prisoners on their own volition also started tunneling, and Confederate authorities at Salisbury wanted to put a stop to this, and so they actually stationed a guard um, about 100 feet outside the prison walls, and that guard of 15 was tasked with foiling prisoners' tunnels. So between November and December of 1864, they stopped 16 tunnels that had been started. So these Union prisoners did not get out. Different fate for this gentleman right here. This is John Hunt Morgan. Notorious Confederate cavalryman raids the state of Ohio in June, July 1863. And to insult him, Union authorities decide to imprison him in the Ohio Penitentiary, not as a prisoner of war, but as an actual common horse thief. So he's considered to be a criminal. And they, I mean, they do the same things to him that they did to convicts when they brought him in. They shaved his hair, and you can see he had lovely hair, of course. So the newspapers in the South kind of lose their mind that they've shaved John Hunt Morgan's hair. Okay, that's fine. 
So they put him in a cell, he and his men. There's 30 to 70 of them. They'll eventually split some of them up. But the men who are with them are in the bottom of the Ohio Penitentiary. And the federal government insists that a military guard be detailed to watch them. Well, that military guard that comes in isn't as familiar with penitentiary regulations as the civilian guard. And so what Morgan and his men start to do when they're going to the dining hall is stealing forks, spoons, knives, plates. Guards are supposed to go into the cells every day and look for that stuff they don't. And so long story short, after weeks of undetected digging, Morgan and his men had realized that their cells were above an air shaft, and if they could get into it, they could get out. So they make their escape on November 20th, 1863. The warden of the Ohio Penitentiary, Nathaniel Marion, and the, and the directors are really angry at this point, and they write to the federal government that if Morgan and his men had remained under civil authority, they would have never been able to get out because their men know the ropes. So lines of authority are blurred here, and also the identity of prisoners is also blurred, as is the assessment of military prisons and penitentiaries. That point of comparison is there throughout the entire war. Next slide. These are a couple examples of that, of how um, the penitentiary program really kind of influenced how wartime officials thought about incarceration in military prisons. So in 1863, U.S. Army Surgeon Daniel Meeker is allowed to go into Richmond's military prisons and inspect them, and he says, no prisoner penitentiary ever seen in a northern state equaled in cheerlessness, unhealthiness, and paucity of rations issued either of the military prisons of Richmond, Virginia. Second, a leveling experience here. It was really interesting when I was doing the research because, um, like I said, POWs are not considered criminals. But several of them adopted that stigma of felon. And they refused to write home because they didn't want their family members to know that they were incarcerated. They were afraid what the rest of their life was going to be like having the stigma follow them. And so you can kind of see some of that here from William Duff. Let prison life be what it is. It may be of war or criminal by quarantine detention in some way, but being deprived of liberty and freedom is a terror and horror to anyone. Next slide, please. Other examples here, editorials to the New York Times regarding Camp Chase. I'm opposed to releasing the prisoners, but I would put them all to work where they can earn their own living. Regarding Johnson's Island, I don't wish on Christian retaliation, but could not these fellows work for their bread upon the public works as well as be pampered in idleness? So civilians assume that anybody who's incarcerated should be responsible in some way for their own upkeep through labor. And then finally, that comparison to convicts. George Pennington writing from Andersonville in May of 1864, we're shut off from the rest of the world and cannot hear half as much news as a murderer, nor are we treated half as well. Next slide. There's other general comparisons um, to what was going on in prisons. This is um, an article that was published from a Washington paper that was reprinted in um, William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator in April of 1863, and it's following the Battle of Corinth and it basically details Union POWs, and they're captured, they're imprisoned somewhere in the South, and they are, this is the title of the talk, actually, they were treated as felons were before prisons were reformed, put in iron, starved, and denied light and air for nearly a year. So you can kind of see, again, thinking back to those concerns that I highlighted from the Boston Prison Discipline Society, there they are. Next slide. And finally, even the closing of military prisons reflected some of the ideas surrounding the penitentiary that were established in the antebellum period in that prisons should form some service. They should, in some ways, be paternal, give oversight to prisoners. So in the case of Camp Chase, federal officials made provisions to care for veterans who couldn't care for themselves. In 1867, the House of Representatives directed that materials from Camp Chase be used for the benefit of the National Asylum for Disabled Soldiers. And that was approved by President Johnson on March 21st, 1867. In the case of Castle Thunder in May 1865, the original key to that institution 
was sent to New York and auctioned off for the benefit of orphans of Union volunteers, which offered them temporary assistance in the war's aftermath. In Salisbury, the Freedmen's Bureau, which was established by Congress towards the end of the war to basically provision, make for provisions and aid freed slaves, had the property and had authorization to sell it off. They actually auctioned it. The highest bidder was a man by the name of Hinton Helper, who in 1857 wrote a book that opposed slavery called The Impending Crisis of the South. He bought it for $1,600. That $1,600 that he used to buy Salisbury went to the Freedmen's Bureau and maybe helped their mission of provisioning former slaves a little bit, but ultimately fell short of enacting meaningful change. And finally, at Johnson's Island, the federal government slowly removed the fortifications and the Ordnance Department, but they kept the Union and Confederate cemeteries intact, so you can still go to see those today if you visit Johnson's Island. The intention of keeping those cemeteries was that the graves, ideally, would long be a site of pilgrimage and inspire conversation about the cost of war and also about the toll of its crisis of imprisonment. Thank you. Oh, good. <clears throat> They've turned this on. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight for the Q&A. You can see over to my left, uh, we have a microphone stand. If you have a question and are mobile, we'd ask that you come up to the stand and we'll, uh, you can ask questions in order there. If you have difficulty getting up to the stand, uh, please raise your hand and I've got the live mic here and I can come over to you uh, so you can ask a question. So please come up if you've got a question. Uh, I will start with one. Uh, you showed the picture of the uh, Confederate soldiers who were making a, an oath mm -hmm. there. What benefit did they gain from taking an oath of allegiance? That's a good question. Um, it depends, honestly, on the prison camp itself. Um, some prisoners who took the oath, like that was actually a sketch of prisoners taking the oath at Johnson's Island. They were shifted into better quarters and they received better rations. So it, the oath could get them that benefit. It could also get them early release. Um, it could also get them not early release to go home, but in the North, it could turn them into galvanized Yankees that were then mustered into the regular army and sent out west to fight Indians. Hello. So I have a question about what type of records were maintained at the prisons. I had an ancestor at Johnson's Island. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what's in the National Archives or elsewhere. They're, they're varied. They do keep prison registers, though, and a lot of those prison registers are um, on site at, at the National Archives in Washington. If you do have um, an ancestor that was imprisoned, the first place, though, that I would check is Fold 3, if you can go through and find some of their um, service records, because there's communication between the archives and that um, institution. If not, it's kind of, a, it's a matter of going there and sitting down with those, those records. Were there any repercussions for, to administrators or guards post the war? What was the last part of that? I missed it. Post the, after the war was over, were there any repercussions against guards or administrators that, you know, were cruel, evil, whatever? There were, the most visible one um, was Captain Henry Wurz of Andersonville who was executed um, for murder in the violation of the laws of war. Um, one of Salisbury's commandants, John G., was also tried by military tribunal, but quite frankly, people just kind of lost interest in his case and it fell by the wayside. Otherwise, there's not. That's, that's literally it. Did you find any relationship between the prison conditions and prisoner exchanges, either prison to prison or prisoner exchanges in the field? There's a lot of shifting around once the exchange cartel breaks down. 
I mean, overall, um, the conditions will worsen because the camps universally become overcrowded. And then, I mean, as far as anything resembling a system, it's kind of figuring out what the prison population is at varying places and then moving prisoners elsewhere. So like a lot of prisoners, for example, were shifted out of Ohio to places like Camp Lookout, or Point Lookout rather, and Elmira in New York. So that's really kind of the correlation is the conditions do get worse and officials need more space. And so they try to figure out essentially what's available, what's open. I, w I was thinking between exchanging prisoners, Confederate Union exchanges like that, where they would release <laughs> Union soldiers and exchange them for Confederate soldiers. Do you mean how that system works? I guess I'm not, I'm not following what you're asking. Uh, did you see any, did you see, find anything in your research that indicated that they did that kind of thing? They did, yeah. I mean, at the beginning of the war, um, they basically used a parole system, um, which was modeled basically off of what was going on in Europe. So at first, um, prisoners were allowed to go home until they received written notification that they had been exchanged on paper, and then they would go back and rejoin their units. Um, after a while, Prison author or authorities, especially in the North, realized that that's not working, and so they made parole camps. So one of the functions I mentioned, Camp Chase served multiple functions throughout the war. One was a parole camp, and so instead of sending soldiers home when they were on parole, they would actually be sent to a site to be watched to make sure that they didn't go home while they were awaiting exchange. Okay. Yep. <laughs> So in your research, have you found actual evidence of enduring social stigma when survivors of camps made it home to their southern and northern communities? You know, what I find when they go home is their fears don't come true. So the men were afraid that they would be looked down upon in society because they had the stigma of being a prisoner. But actually, when they do get home, in a lot of post-war, either, either individual recordings or in newspapers, there's celebration of what the men withstood. And then there's also, of course, you know, the investigation by the House of Representatives beginning in 1867 of the condition in southern prisons. And so a lot of the men are summoned by the federal government to come forward and give testimony as to what they experienced. So it's really kind of ironic that, you know, outside of their own mind, they're not having those kind of negative stigmas attached to them. All right, thank you. Dr. Thank you. Uh, reminder, we do have Yelena uh, down front. If anyone is interested in the Cape Fear Civil War Roundtable, uh, Cape Fear River with uh, Chris Feinfeld. Ladies and gentlemen, somebody left their phone behind. If you're missing your phone, please uh, come up here and retrieve it.